Okay, so four o'clock, and I think we can we can start. Um, as as always, thank you very much for joining us and in this workshop. My name is David David Andres Leon. I'm here with my colleague Bernard Di Lorente from from McNeil, Europe. Hello, everyone. There he is. Uh, he'll be answering your questions in um, chat on, or, or questions and answers from Zoom. So if you have any doubts uh, during the during the course, don't be don't be shy and ask Bernard whatever you you have you have a, a, a question about. Um, I won't be I won't be looking too much into chat, but Bernard will be. So. Um, I think without further ado, we can we can start. Uh, there's a request from from someone in chat about uh, data trees and and those kind of stuff. And I think it's also it's also going to be more, uh, of course covered in a more advanced course in the future. Now the next course we don't know whether it's going to be immediately next week or the week the week after that. But of course, as usually we will keep you posted through the Rhino blog. Um, in any case. Thanks again for joining and, and let's just jump into the subject here. So if, if you can see my screen here, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start this uh, lesson with, with um, maybe just uh, telling you what we're gonna cover this, this time. And it's gonna be especially about uh, um, conditionals and for loops or more or less iterations. Um, I, I consider this to be m maybe more of the one, the, the most important subjects in, in, in scripting because here you will really see the advantages of, of, of scripting as opposed to just uh, visual programming through Grasshopper and others. And I'll definitely exp explain you why during this session. Um, now, just to, uh, to understand first uh, the first part of, of uh, conditionals, I think it's important to to know how uh, what conditioners uh, are actually based upon, and these ones are based more or less on this. It's, this is what I call uh, operators. So, to start with, let's just as usual throw our GH Python canvas into the uh, component into the canvas here, and to begin with, we're we're just going to open it without uh, modifying it at all. Okay, um, uh -huh. I'm going to delete. Everything from here. I you? think I think your your screen is uh, frozen. I cannot see anything. Is it? Oh, the, yeah. Let me just stop sharing and share again then. Yes. Second screen there. We are. Um, how about now? Can, can you see it now? Yeah. Now okay. now I can see the GH Python component. Great. Okay. So you haven't really missed much. What I've, I've done is just uh, thrown a, a GH Python component into the canvas as usual from the math script tab here and just open it and delete everything from the, from the insides of it. So what we have now is just a, a standard GH Python component with nothing inside, inside it to begin with. Uh, if, if my screen freezes again, please uh, let me know so that I can I can fix that, okay? Um, so in order to un really to understand, I'm gonna zoom in here a bit. In order to really understand about uh, conditionals, we first need to understand what are the what are the comparison operators in Python, okay? And these are just um, a few symbols that we usually use to, to, to compare two variables. Mm. For, uh, in this case, I'm just going to start by probably bringing a, a numbers letter here on the right, on the left hand side, outside in Grasshopper. I'm going to copy it. And this is, you can actually, it doesn't matter what you put in here, if it's a float or it's an integer, just uh, usually, as usual, I'm not even going to change the name, just make sure that you change the type hint to wh whatever it corresponds. In my, case, in my case, since I'm using, an, I'm using integers, I'm going to change it to integers for both. Uh, Super important thing to do, um, always in the beginning. Okay, and okay, I press test, and the component is already happy that it has something inside of it. And of course, I print, I print x, I print, and I print y, and it's going to give me both of the both of the values. Now, how how do, would I compare these two values? And there's this is where the comparison operators come in place. If I would actually do this 
print x and say it's equal to y, I'm going to get a Boolean in, as in return. And this is, this is what the comparison operators are all about. They will always return a, a, a Boolean to you uh, from, this, uh, from this expression here, which actually tells you whether the a comparison operator that you're using fulfills. No? In this case, as you can see, uh, what I'm doing is just comparing x to y. By um, in order to do that, I'm using this uh, Python uh, operator that is a double equal that actually tells it it's uh, it's asking the question is x equal to y, and in return I'm getting a true or false, as you can see, right? So whenever the the slider matches, whenever uh, eight is equal to eight, I actually get true uh, a true value because x is a, in, in that case x is equal to y, right? It's as simple as that. So I could actually do the opposite of this and ask whether x is not equal to y. And that's by actually using the exclamation here before the, before the equal. And then in the, as opposed to the previous one, I will always get a, whether x is not equal to y. So when x is not equal to y here, I will get a true, as you can see. Whenever there's a case that x is actually equal to y, like in this case, three and three, I would get false because uh, then this one doesn't fulfill, right? Now, same, um, same logic applies for us also, also for uh, bigger than, right? So whenever x is bigger than y, I will get a true. Whenever x is smaller, uh, whenever it's not bigger than y, I will get a false, right? Now, uh, this for, for those of you who have who've used this logic in Grasshopper, this is very simple, I think, to, to grasp. It's just uh, you have to learn the new, uh, probably the new uh, symbols here, the new way to compare, to compare those. Um, same goes for less than, right? So whenever x is less than y, I get, a, I, I get a true. Whenever x is not x and y, I get a false, right? Now, there's also an sort of in-between uh, compar uh, comparison operator, which it's super useful because as you can see here, these two, don't, they really don't cover the, the, the occasion when x and y are equal. So for that, you can actually use x whenever, um, I'm just gonna put it in here to just to, to make it a little bit ordered. Uh, so print x when it's actually larger than and equal to y, right? So whenever x is larger than and equal to y, it, it will give me a true. So when, as you can see, whenever it's whenever it's equal as well, then you're specifying that it's true. No, whenever it's it's uh, less, whenever this doesn't fulfill, it's actually false. Mm. Same goes for this one. You can print x, give me true when x is less or equal to y, right? So whenever it's equal, it actually also covers that part of the, of the equality, but when, and, and whenever it's larger, it's gonna be false, right? Now, these really don't seem you too much, too, very too useful by themselves, but whenever you see this, uh, whenever we see these uh, if conditionals in the in the next in the next part, it's going to be maybe more or less the basis of it, right? And there's um, so before we jump into those, I also want to introduce you to the logical operators for those of you who don't know them. Uh, sorry, logical operators here, um, and those are actually um, sort of concatenation of of Boolean values. Um, so th these are usually taught on, taught on math in schools and, and maybe you've probably seen them in another, in one way or the other, but it's just um, a way to say when this is true and this is true, uh, give me true, right? So actually the end logical operator here, it's actually testing, it, it, it will result on true only when both of the of the two conditions are true, right? 
So for example, if I say, if I use the same print true and false, sorry, it's actually a way to say, uh, only give me uh, true when everything that's inside here is true. If one of these is false, like in this case, because true and uh, th this one and this one are not true, then you get a false, right? And um, this is probably going to be a bit clearer in, the, in when when I use a variable afterwards. I just want you to introduce. Uh, I just wanted to to throw them here so that uh, they get introduced. Uh, same goes for, for example, if I print true or false, right? In this case, uh, any of these two have to fulfill in order to be true. So uh, whether it's this one or this one, if any of these fulfill, then then you're going to get a true. As a as a result, right? So and there's actually a third one which is the not true, which actually gives you the opposite of whatever you input. So if you say print not true, in this case, it's always going to give you the opposite of what you of, of what you put in here, right? Print not false, it's going to give you as a result true, right? So let, let's make a, a little practical example before we continue. Um, I'm going to make a variable called conditional to, to start with. And I'm going to, uh, to this one, I'm going to assign the result of this uh, conditional operation here, right? And I'm going to output it to A. Oops, sorry. Mm, right? So I what I'm doing here is storing the result of this uh, operation of this test uh, of, of, of equality in this particular case. And I'm storing it to this variable called conditional. And then again, I'm actually outputting this conditional value to the outside of, of the Grasshopper Python, of the GH Python component, right? So you can see uh, for now, I'm just using a sort of like a, an out print. So it's more or less the same. Um, but what if I actually do another thing, for example, if I say, give me uh, X when it's equal to Y or X when it's uh, larger than five, right? <laughs> now this is gonna change because it's, it's not only gonna give me true whenever uh, X is equal to Y, as you can see, because it fulfills either this one or this one, it's giving me true also when x is larger than five too, right? If I add an equal here, then it's actually probably gonna be the same because x is, in that case, uh, x is equal to y is also covered in this particular condition here, right? Mm. Okay, so this is probably, the, this is just the beginning of, of, of if, uh, uh, if conditional because this is some of the stuff that's gonna be the, the main part of what we're going to see now in the in the if and else conditionals that we, that's going to be up next now <clears throat> if we um, i'm just going to go down here throw another gh python component as usual um for this one probably i'm, I'm not going to start with anything to begin with but <clears throat> I am gonna delete the, the thing that comes with the component so that I can start from scratch, right? And I'm gonna call this uh, if else conditional. Mm. Okay, so now this is already starting to, to touch into, into programming stuff. If else conditionals or any type of conditionals are, are more or less the basics of of programming and scripting, because they already provide a way for you to to work with the flow of 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 a routine, right? This if and else would actually uh, get the um, transport the data to one or the other uh, sides of this of this boolean of, or or of this toggle, uh, whether it fulfills or not a certain condition condition that you specify. Um, let's just start uh, with a practical example, which is going to make it clear. Um, I'm going to put a, a boolean toggle here. 
and bring it inside of, of Grasshopper, of GH Python, yeah? So as usual, I'm in, in this case, I'm gonna change the name and I'm gonna call this condition. This is just gonna be, this is gonna represent any condition which is true or false. And of, as usual, I'm gonna assign the type kin to it. In this case, I'm assigning the Boolean one, right? Uh, perfect. So if I if I print condition, um, I should get just the the result of this boolean toggle inside of the component, right? Now I'm gonna apply what I learned, what we have learned already in the previous part of of uh, operations, and uh, I'm gonna start to use the if uh, statement here. And I'm going to say if this condition is equal to true, right? Which means if these two are equal, if these two are true, then pr print condition is true, right? Now, <clears throat> what happens? <clears throat> I'm going to comment this out so that it's clear. And of course, when when the condition is equal to false, nothing happens. Whenever the condition is set to true, the program actually catches this and, and starts to run this code. And that's, actually, that's uh, inside this if condition clause. Now, <clears throat> notice that I've actually uh, did something kind of uh, new here in the, in, the, in the way that I wrote here. I used these four dots to include this part below the if condition. And this starts, this starts to touch um, a subject that is called uh, scope. And this um, four dots in Python, they're called indentation, right? So whenever there's an if condition or a for loop or, or, a, uh, or, a def or a function, whenever there's something that has to belong, that belongs after a two uh, uh, a column, means that everything that is uh, within these four dots belongs to this condition here. That is no different than, than for example, when you're writing in Word uh, or in, in any other text editor and you're saying, hey, chapter one, right? And then, then this is part, sorry, this is part of chapter one, right? To chapter two, sorry. <clears throat> This is part of chapter two, right? The, so uh, this is just an example. You shouldn't write this code because it's gonna fa fail, of course. But it's just to say that uh, the fact that this is actually indented here means that this belong, belongs to this uh, scope up here, to this statement up here, right? <clears throat> so um, in order to, to bring these four dots, you can either uh, type them as, as, as dots, uh, spaces, sorry. You, you cannot write them as dots here. They are actually spaces. Or you can just press tab key and then that will give you the four dots uh, by default because this is actually something that you're gonna use a lot. Okay, so just to, just to continue. Um, the, the second part of the if else conditionals is the else plus, right? Now I'm gonna use the else. <coughs> And I'm gonna put a column here. And you can see, as soon as I enter, I press enter, it immediately brings me to this scope because it, uh, Python already knows that this, whatever I put after this, this column belongs to the scope of this else. So I'm gonna say print condition is false. <clears throat> right? Now, what happens if I, if I press the toggle button when it's true? It runs this line, condition is true. When condition is equal to false, then it's printing condition is false. Now, <clears throat> this is the way it works. A, a Boolean, a, a, sorry, um, an if else a clause is nothing uh, else than sort of a switch, right? That actually says, whenever this fulfills, whenever whatever is after the if fulfills, whenever this is, is true, then this happens. And if it's not true, then this happens down here, right? Now, this probably, this shouldn't be really too hard to grasp because 
uh, this is something that, that also happens in Grasshopper and, and when you're using the, the mathematical operas, uh, operators, right? Uh, let's say, for example, <coughs> equality, right? You're testing these two for equality. <coughs> and when it fulfills, it goes on this, on this end. When it doesn't fulfill, it goes on this end. And it's nothing unlike that. It's, it's actually exactly the same. <coughs> um, the only variation here probably is, the, is that you can actually put something in between here, which I'm going to show you in a little bit, right? <coughs> For now, I'm gonna put. I'm gonna make another example that's probably gonna be a little bit more numerical, for which I'm gonna bring uh, a couple of other sliders, uh, two simple examples, um, two more inputs here in the Python component. One is gonna be called num1, the other one's gonna be called num2, right? Connect. I'm gonna connect my sliders. Oops. Um, type hint to integer or or actually whatever you want to put into in here. I'm, I'm just gonna use these two to compare, right? And I'm gonna use another, I'm gonna make another example just to make it a little clearer. So I'm gonna say if number two is bigger than number, uh, well, to make it clear, number one is bigger than number two, right? And do something, in this case, just gonna print um, x, it's bigger than y, right? <clears throat> when when number one is not bigger than number two, which means else, then x is smaller than y, right? <clears throat> um, I'm just gonna quickly comment this out so I just keep the part that I'm interested in. And now I can actually move my sliders and they will be comparing one with the other as, as we did upstairs now. So I, I, when, when the case that the number one is bigger than the number two, it's printing X is bigger than, what, than Y. When that is not the case, then X is smaller than Y. But what happens when X is actually equal to Y? This is, actually, this is a bit buggy, you see, because and um, since there is no condition for, for that exact situation here, right? Then uh, what Python is doing is actually assuming that part and saying X is smaller than Y because it's not bigger than Y really, no? But it's actually not, not, uh, it's not smaller and it's not bigger either. So for that, we have another, uh, I'm gonna introduce you to another, uh, part of the if else clause, which is the elif, right? And, oh, sorry, I might, I might as well just use this one. Um, I'm in, in the middle, in between these two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna type elif, right? Which means, uh, which I'm gonna explain later. And then I'm gonna say elif num one, it's actually equal to num two. Then I'm gonna print x is equal to y, okay? Now, this is actually a bit better, you can see, because when x is equal to y here, or when num1 is equal to num2, in this case, right? Then I actually get a, a more uh, precise statement of what's going on, because actually x and uh, num1 is equal to two, and it's not assuming that it's, that it's uh, smaller like before, right? Now, uh, what I'm using here is this keyword called elif, which is something that you use in tandem with these other two. And the way it reads is like this, the way that the Python reads this is, it goes like this. First, it tests whether num1, it's bigger than two. So it's not, right? Then it actually says, if, if that is not true, else, right? If num1, is equal to two, then it runs this part. And if that, if, if that one doesn't fulfill, it goes to the next one, right? So this is pretty handy because you can actually use as many of, of these ellipses as you would like. And, and, and it's just to catch uh, states in between these two, these two booleans, whether if and else, right? And um, just to prove that it's useful, that, uh, in, if I would actually just use another if here, 
it's going to be uh, it's going to be dif uh, of course it's going to be different because python is assuming that this is one uh, if conditional and this is another so in the in the case that uh, num1 is bigger than num2 as you can see it's giving me two results right so that's why i use elif in order to catch this condition in, be in between these two. Um, great. So I think for as for conditionals, this is uh, pretty much it. It's not really complicated, right? Now I can actually use um, uh, what is what is called a nested uh, conditional. So I can put ifs inside ifs, and that is uh, actually super useful because I mean that that really starts to gain a lot of control in the in the flow of the of how the of how the code works, no. So um, I'm going to, to to do that using the same condition that I brought here, and I'm going to say if condition equals to true, right? And now because I want to put this all of these parts inside this scope because it kind of be as I said before it belongs to this chapter, right? Uh, I want to actually uh, bring bring it four uh, four spaces forward. Uh, now I'm going to teach you like uh, pay attention to this in in the Python component. If you select everything and hit tab, it's going to immediately bring everything that you have selected four spaces forward. So then I'm actually um, enclosing all of this part into the into the first condition. Right. I'm going to do it again. If I press, if I select this and press Shift Tab, it's gonna bring it back. If I select it and print and, and press Tab, it's gonna bring it forward, right? Of course, I could I could also go the I could also go the the very manual way and say four 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 right? And that's probably too long. Now you know that with by selecting and Shift Tab or just tab, it's gonna bring it forward or backwards. So by bringing these forward four points, I have actually included all of this code inside my if condition here. And I'm actually testing now when the first condition uh, happens. So if this condition is equal to true, then run this code, right? If, because it's false now, it's not doing anything. Actually, the, the, there's nothing happening in this component. But when I when I uh, bring it to true, when condition is actually equal to true, then this then it goes to this other if and it run starts to run this code this line, uh, this code line by line. Right, I could actually uh, specify when nothing is happening by saying else, um, uh, put a colon, and um, this is another uh, trick that you probably will find in the code when there's just uh, when it's a one one liner when you don't want to put more than than a few lines you can actually put it straight forward uh, straight forward in front of the else and say eh, nothing happens here right so uh print sorry i forgot to print this <laughs> there mm, nothing happens here there so what's happening here when when the condition is true so if the the variable condition is equal to true it's going through this code uh, else when it's false here then it's printing nothing happens right this is the same as doing this but um just uh, for you to be prepared that you might find this also that when there's when it's just one line inside of this else clause you can actually put it just in front and it will and it will work. I'm just gonna leave it like that so it's actually more readable. Okay. Uh, perfect. So, if um, if there are no questions for me, I can actually I, I will. Uh, there's the, the, there's a question. Uh -huh. uh, um, uh, 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 the question is: Is actually Python component faster executing the operation than the Grasshopper component? doing the same function um i don't think so not it's it's this for this type of, of things it's really hard to compare because the computation is so fast that it's it's not going to be much of a difference to be honest 
but um, in other types of computations, because because the grasshopper components are are compiled, they will be probably faster than the than what you write right here in code. So for for this particular case, I would I would say the difference is ne negligible. For the case of large computations, uh, it will depend on what you're doing inside of the component, but the compiled components are usually faster. And also sometimes the code uh, that they have inside is actually much more optimized. Um, is there another one maybe? Not so far. Okay, so I hope this is clear. This is uh, quite simple. I, I think for those of you who already know Grasshopper, it's just a way to, to control the data flow uh, whether one condition com fulfills or not. Um, quite like the, the comparison components that you have here, equality, uh, equality larger than, smaller than, similarity. Um, but this will really open the possibilities for our code to, to control the data flow um, of, the, of the script. Now, I'm going to move now to the iterations parts, which is a bit more difficult, right? And I'm gonna, okay, be, before I go into, into iterations, I want to explain why iterations are so useful and so key to, to scripting in, in Grasshopper, right? So here, um, what I have now, it's just a scheme of a component, right? You have a couple of slider, three sliders here is going into, into one Grasshopper component and you start drawing your, your gra Grasshopper graph like this, right? You put one component here, you connect it to the other one here, they both get to connected to something else, they, they get connected to something else, and they get connected to something else in the end, right? So this is just a scheme of a very basic grasshopper definition, right? So what happens when I change the slider in one of these components? Uh, uh, sorry, what, in, in the beginning of the graph? What happens in grasshopper is that the, the, the data starts to flow from component to component and updates. So first, this one gets updated, then this one gets updated, then this one gets updated, then this one in the end gets updated. And it's really a very linear flow, where every time that you make a move or make a change in a slider or in a panel or, or in an input, you, uh, this will happen, right? If the input will, if the slider would be here, then probably the, then just the next components will, will, will get affected. But the, the idea behind here is that it's a, a linear flow from, from left to right. And for those of you who, who have some experience in Grasshopper, uh, know this, and know this that this can be also a, a sort of a, a, um, a hiccup or, or, or problematic in, in some ways when you want to actually bring data backwards, right? If you would actually uh, would like to send the result from this component to to this slider or to this input, then in Grasshopper it's it's not really possible unless you you use uh, certain com certain plugins like Anemone, or you you actually go into scripting, which is what we're doing now. Now, the the magic be behind uh, scripting and iterations is that you, that you can, with the same definition, you could actually uh, take this part, for example, if you this is something that you want to to iterate in, or or you want to actually bring the the output of this component into this one, you could put all of this into one uh, scripting component and have the data iterate, right? So, so in this case, the output, the output of this component will pro would, could go into this one or could go into this one and they could actually iterate one time or the other in, uh, in a circular way and not just in a linear, linear way like we saw before, no? So this is actually what the, the GH Python component is doing in, in the background when, when, when we start to use for loops, which is, which is the thing that I'm gonna teach you now is actually doing this iteration uh, from when within say the component then bringing it to the to the next part um, now yeah the, the main um, syntax of the for loop is this is um, for a, a variable which is something that you make up a name of the variable in a list Okay, and this is um, this is what I'm going to show you. Probably it's going to be much more easy. Uh, it's much more easy to understand in a in a practical example. So let, let's just bring another huge Python component to the canvas as usual. Um, is there a question? No. Okay, this is. Um, oh yes, there's actually there's one. Sorry. 
Uh, um, to a pie term to this okay this is this is a bit off topic and and it's it's way it's a, it's quite it's interesting but it's another i think it's gonna i'm not even sure we're gonna co cover that stuff in in, in this uh, python series but i could uh, point you out to some good examples in the end if you want so stick with stick with us um now uh, sorry um coming back to the to the to the for loops, yeah. Now I'm going to start to open this component. As usual, delete the insides of it, and I'm going to start with. Hold on. I'm just going to start by probably bringing. Um, I'm going to bring in a list from from the outside. Yeah. In this case, I'm just going to do a panel here, and I'm going to say. This is a list, right? No, all good. This is a list. Okay, of string. Even better. I'm using the multi line data so that, that this becomes uh, actually a list of strings. And I'm going to plug them into the, to the input. As we already know, when we input a list, where I'm going to use the list axis right uh, uh, here, so that uh, the component knows it's a list. And I am going to also tell it it's a list of strings, um, as usual. Don't forget to specify the type every time. Uh, I'm going to rename this one to something more readable. This is probably going to be called list strings. You can name it, of course, you can name it to whatever you want. This is what I'm going to use, a list of strings. And then I am also going to use a series component to make a series of numbers. Right? So mm, this component provides, provides a, a sequence of numbers, which is actually also a list from 0 to, in this case, a number, uh, 10 numbers from 0 to 9. And in order to make it more interesting, I'm, just, I'm, I'm going to manipulate the start point of this list and also the count okay and this is probably going to become can become handy in the when we start making our examples and i'm gonna change this to list of numbers i'm gonna assign it to a list axis so that the grass comp uh, python component notes is a list and i'm gonna tell it is of integers mm. perfect now, this is a this is our basic setup to 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 start the for loops, right? So I'm gonna be talking about for loop iterations here, right? And okay, so the main point being is, um, what if I would actually want to for, uh, do something to each of the items of this list, right? And this is what iterations are all about. I could easily start by saying, for example, print a list strings item zero, right? And that will give me item zero. If I copy paste, I can actually get access to number one as well. And, and so on and so forth, right? Two, three, four, Right, and I'm, miss I'm missing one. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is what actually this is what it took for me to get uh, a reading or, or to print each of the items of this list. And as you can see, this is neither efficient nor parametric, which which means that if I actually would include another item in this list, then I would actually have to manually print another uh, type another print. Uh, item here, which is of course not the optimal way, right? And this is what this is where the iterations are uh, are all about. This is iterations are made so that you can actually uh, go through visit every of the items in a list and do something to them, in, uh, right? That's that's why my that this is where my my rather incomplete. Uh, a slide here 
was trying to say, right? For every item in the list, do something down here. Okay. Now let me just comment this out so that we, we don't get this printing in the in the component because we don't really need it. And I'm gonna start to 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 do some for loops here. Now um the for keyword is the one that we're gonna use be using here. And then I'm gonna be making up um a variable, like um, a name that I would actually make up for myself. In this case, I'm gonna use I because because uh, I is sort of a convention that we use in Python for for the variables in for loops. And I'm gonna say for I in, oops, in list of strings, <clears throat> do something, right? And what am I gonna do in this case? I'm going to do what I just just what I did before and print i. Okay? Now if you run this code then you can see this is actually the same as what I did here before only on three lines. Right? And it's nothing else than saying for every item in this list in this list that I'm specifying do something to that item. So I'm actually using this this variable called i that represents each of the items of this list until I actually finish the for loop, right? So for example, if I print I and then I print uh, done, it's gonna, what, what it's gonna do, it's, it's gonna first visit the print, uh, visit the first item and print uh, this, and then it's gonna print done. It's gonna visit the second item and you're gonna print is, and then it's gonna print done, and so on and so forth. And you can see that when running the code, right? Um, <clears throat> this is important, and because uh, the main one of the main characteristics of this for loop, because it's inside this scope, because it's it has these four uh, spaces of indentation, means that it actually uh, whatever you put inside this for loop, um, it's actually uh, thrown away after the for loop is done, right? Now, <clears throat> let's uh, make more examples so that uh, this becomes a little clearer. <clears throat> as uh, as I told you from the in the previous tutorial, you know that you can comment out by selecting and pressing Control Tab, uh, Control uh, Slash. For some people with a with a different uh, keyboard with a different uh, language, this might be a bit tricky, but if you have a keyboard that you can actually the, uh, access the slash uh, in one key, it's quite straightforward. <clears throat> now, let's make another example, right? <clears throat> this is nothing else than saying uh, for x, in this case, I'm gonna uh, call it x. I don't wanna call it i because just to show you that you can use anything. And instead of having a list that I had before, I'm just gonna make up a list in here and say for x in, um, I'm going to declare the list here so that you know what I'm talking about. This is another example, right? And if I, if I print X now, you can see what I'm talking about, right? I'm actually passing the list here uh, without declaring it first. I'm passing the list very straightforward here. And for every item in this list, I'm printing, right? Now you can imagine the, the huge uh, importance of this because uh, in this case, I, ha I have actually hard coded the list, right? But in the case from before, mm. if I actually change the list, if, uh, if I would delete, for example, off, then this becomes parametric and, this, and, and the last, um, item doesn't get print because I have deleted it. No. If I add another item, then it's getting printed as well. No. And there, there are of course many, many, many um, scenarios where this becomes very handy. And I'm probably, I, I, I hope I had the time to show you a few. Um, now, there. Are, uh, this is the case where you would use a for loop um, 
and use the item itself, right? In this case, for, we are iterating through the list, in this case, a list of strings, and we are using the item itself, right? But there are some cases where, we'd, where, where, we'd, where we would prefer to actually use the index of the item instead of the, of the item itself. And I'll show you when and why, right? And I'm gonna call this um, <clears throat> for loops with indexes, just to differentiate it a bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment this out. And I'm gonna start to show you how this works step, step, by, step by step, right? So <clears throat> first of all, I'm gonna get the length of the, of, of the number list, length of numbers list. And you know that from previous lessons that you can get the length of the list with a length keyword. And I'm gonna, in this case, I'm gonna use, use list of number, right? So this actually gives me the, if I print this, this gives me the length of the number list here, which actually should be equivalent to this count. Of course, we, uh, we don't know this from, from from outside, so I'm just uh, accessing it again. And now I am going to create a list that represents uh, the indexes of this list, actually represents each of these numbers in the left-hand side of the panel. So how do I do that? I actually, I will actually use the range uh, keyword that I used in the previous lesson as well <clears throat> to create a series of numbers from with this length, with the length of the list that I'm inputting here, <clears throat> right? So when I actually print this list, as you can see, I have, I have created a list that represents the indexes of this, uh, of this number, of this list here, right? <clears throat> um, let me just uncomment here. If I print the list itself, which is called list of numbers, I get the list, as you can see, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. And if I print the indexes, then I get the equivalent indexes of each of those, no? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, um, great. This is parametric, you know, perfect. Now, how is this useful? <clears throat> this is because there are some times when, when using a for loop that I would, I would actually like to use i in the list of indexes and not in the list of the list itself in order to, to actually access the items of the list number list by index, mm. right? Mm -mm. Now, if I print this, and um, as you can see, I, if I print I, I am getting first, sorry, no, I've done this a bit uh, too hasty. Now, if I print I, I get a, I get a printout of the, I, of the indexes because this is the list that I'm actually um, iterating, you know, the indexes list, but I am actually using this I, this index to access the item in that list, right? Mm. And there are a couple of reasons why I would like to do this. But first, um, I would actually like to show you the proper way to do this because I, this was just, a, this was just a, a way, an explanation of how to, how to get to the actual, ways, uh, actual way of writing this for loop, which is for i in range len and the list that I want to iterate, let's say the num list, right? print list number i, <clears throat> right? Now, I want you to think about this and, and what we have done here in one line is, is the same thing that we did here before, only without having to store this into different variables, right? This length list of numbers represents this uh, length list of numbers as Python is highlighting here, right? <clears throat> so this, one results in the in the length uh, of, of this list, which is actually six. And then with the result, I'm actually creating a range, which is what I'm doing here, 
right? I'm doing up here. I'm creating a range with the with the length of the list. So what the, what what is actually the result of this whole uh, kind of nested function is the same as the indexes list that we had before. <clears throat> but this is the way that you that you usually write a for loop to to begin with, right? But the I I reckon that this is a um, when you when you see this in the first uh, the first time you see a for loop it's rather confusing but I, um, this was just a way to try to show you where does this come from right and is by iterate uh, trying to get a list first of the indexes of the list and with those indexes accessing the items of the list itself right. Why does the list start from two? Because uh, <clears throat> I am actually, uh, this is a list that I'm creating in Grasshopper. So the list in this case starts from two, as you can see. The list, the list itself starts from, from six. The indexes always start from zero, right? So in the, on, on, as you can see on, the, on the, the list is a list from six to 11 but the indexes never change. They are, they are always a list from zero to five, right? The indexes is just an identifier of the, of the item here. So that's kind of like a generic identifier. As you can see, the string list also has the same. And I can, maybe this is probably gonna be clear, make it clearer for you. I can actually replace this to the string list and also re replace this to the string list and it's gonna pr also print the list. Right. <clears throat> Great. Now, <clears throat> why is this useful? And it's it's uh, seems like a very kind of tedious, long way to do exactly the same of, of what I did here, uh, up here. Right. To just uh, iterate through the items of this list. Now, one of the advantages of this is that I can actually, um, for instance, use the 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 item here to access the other items in the list in the same scope in, in the same four iteration. Now let me give you an example. And I'm going to change this back to the numbers. So change this back to numbers <clears throat> so that I get back to, to using my, my list of numbers here. And <clears throat> for instance, what I want to do here, um, usually, when I when I use a for loop, um, I'm not using it to print it to print stuff. I'm using I'm using it to do something more useful, right? And in order to store whatever comes outside of the for loop, whatever uh, what, whatever is the output output of the uh, of the for loop, I need to make a variable first. For, for example, in the case that I want to make, let's say I want to um, add all of these numbers of this of this list together, right? I can do that by using the, the sum uh, keyword, sum list numbers. It will actually give me the, 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 the sum of all of the numbers. But in order to make my example work, I'm, an, I'm gonna use this first. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say total addition equals to zero first. Okay, and bear with me, this is how it was gonna work. So I'm assigning this variable to zero to begin with. And then, um, instead of printing, um, what I'm going to do for each of the of the loops of this uh, of this four, I am going to take my total addition, right, and I'm going to assign the same variable, the same value. So total addition equals total addition plus the item that corresponds to the to that iteration, right. Now let's print what happens to total addition after we have made this loop. As you can see, I get actually the same result as the sum of the total of, of the of the list. Right? It's actually the same. So um, again, to to those of you who are who are new to programming, this is, this could be a bit uh, tricky, and you might have to to do them a couple of times to understand. But what's going on here is, I am declaring a variable called total addition right here, up here, which is in the beginning called, um, is beginning is zero. 
That's the, the value that it stores. <clears throat> the first time that the, that the for loop uh, goes, it takes this zero and it says, I'm gonna assign uh, to this variable, I'm gonna assign whatever it's there before and the item of the list. So the first time is zero plus seven, and then it stores, and this becomes zero. Then it goes to the second item of the list and it says, okay, now it's seven, right? And now list, list of number is actually item one. So it's seven plus eight, it's like actually equal to 15 and so on and so forth. And that's the way that the for loop keeps looping until it finishes going through all of the items in these lists and adding them all together. And they get stored in this total addition variable, which is actually stored outside of the for loop, right? Now, this is important. And that's actually the, the, main, uh, the main reason why we would actually uh, would use the indexes of the, of the for loop instead of using the, the, the items themselves. Now, <clears throat> what if, for example, I, I would like to use, um, let's say just, I would just to uh, like to, add the even numbers here, right? So this is something that I cannot do straight up with the sum function. And I'm gonna say even addition equals to zero to start with. This is zero, this is just a placeholder. And I'm, in this case, I want to uh, specify a condition that tells me that only this, the items with the even uh, numbers should Add, right, so in this case, I want to add zero, uh, item zero, seven, nine, and 11, right? And for that, I can actually use an if clause here that says if the, if the residual of the item divided by two, this is actually called uh, a modulus. And for those of you who know math, this is, this is no surprise to you. If the residual of the, of the number of the item divided by two, it's equal to zero, that actually means that this number is even, and then add the number to the, to the placeholder that I had before. Plus list item one. Oops, even addition, even addition, even addition there. <clears throat> right, so now if I print even addition, And then I, I am gonna get uh, the summation of all of the numbers that are just, that uh, the, whose uh, indexes are even, because here I am actually saying, if the index of the number is divisible by two, sorry, if the division of the number by two has a residual of zero, that is what, this is what the modulus does, then add the number to the one before. Otherwise, it does nothing like we saw on the, on the previous component, right? <clears throat> so that is actually another reason why we, why we would use the, the for loop with an item here. And um, I guess that's it. We, we are, it's, it's already five and, and this is a, this is being kind of a, uh, rather intense uh, for loop tutorial, I think. But I'd be happy to take any questions because I know that this, this when you presented with this in the beginning, this is probably a, a rather complicated subject to understand, but I hope that I've at least made a, a good run to, to try to explain it. So if you have any questions, uh, do let me know. Are there any questions? Mm, not right now. Just okay. Hey, David, I saw those already. Um, okay, then that's that's it for today, I guess. Uh, okay, let please keep an eye on the on the next sessions of the of this that le, le, continuous line of tutorials that we're doing here, and hopefully maybe next time we can see more. Um, iterations in depth. Cheers. Bernat, you want to say something? Thank you, everyone. Hmm. Thank you, David.
Thanks for that. See you.